Um, so yeah, I'm Paul Stacy, the Executive Director of the Open Education Consortium, welcoming you to this uh, webinar on open education leadership. Um, it's really fun to see people from all over the world here. I've had a few little conversations already this morning <clears throat> before we get underway. Um, we'll leave chat going. Uh, this, I hope, will be a bit of an interactive session in terms of inviting you to um, to ask questions, to make suggestions, to, uh, to kind of uh, share your own views on open education leadership and, and maybe even your thoughts on what's required in terms of enabling more open education leadership than what's currently taking place. Um, even before I get underway, if there's something specific you'd like to ensure that I address, feel free to drop it into chat right now. Um, and, uh, and thank you those of you who have introduced yourself in chat. It's really great to see people really from all over the world here, um, which is one of the most amazing things about all this technology we get to use is like a way of convening uh, people from around the world. I'm going to do a little screen sharing here. I did prepare some stuff. So, um, and I also have a set of links that I want to explore with you all. Um, so that's me. <laughs> um, the first thing I want to mention about this topic of open education leadership is that I think of it as having a relationship to this spectrum, which I've just put up on the screen right now. I call this the spectrum of open education innovation or the magnitude of it. Um, and this really pertains to people's views on the significance of open education. And it, it's, uh, in my conversations with people, I've noticed that people's views on open education are, are directly related to their thoughts about the extent to which there's a significant role for leadership. And so um, I wanted to share this with you. I haven't actually uh, shared this or talked about this much with others, but I thought I'd use it in today's session as a way of framing leadership. So, on the far left end of the spectrum are people who feel that open education is just like a minor tweak to the existing education system. This would be uh, people who think that simply swapping out a closed proprietary publisher's textbook with an open textbook is, uh, is, is really what the kind of thing that open education is about and that's sufficient. The system doesn't really change. You're just kind of swapping some things around. And then at the far right end of the spectrum, <clears throat> excuse me, is another perspective, which is that open education is like its major innovation that is a disruptor that fundamentally will change the entire education system. And uh, I'd be curious to see actually where you sit on this spectrum. Maybe you can just pick a number between one and nine and uh, drop it into chat to, sh to say how, how you view open education. Um, the reason this is significant is because depending upon where you sit on this spectrum, the kinds of things that you'd be seeking in terms of leadership will, will vary. And, um, and I'm going to primarily talk about it as being something that's on the right end of the spectrum. <laughs> so I'll be talking about open education leadership as being essentially a major change or at least potentially a major change to to the education system and the kinds of things that might be required there in terms of making that happen or supporting that kind of change and i can see a few people a few people have dropped in i'm just going to go and look at uh, what people have said in chat all right so nine eleven <laughs> okay <laughs> oh well, that's fun all right. Well, so I, I think it seems like some of you share some of the views that I have in terms of it being a significant change. Um, uh, this is another perspective I want to use to frame, and that is that uh, open education has uh, um, often been a bottom-up kind of activity. Some early adopters are, you know, get engaged with open education. They start doing it, using it in their classes, uh, using it across their their um, curricula and and really when we're speaking about leadership we're talking about also enabling the top down so if we can get top down and bottom up working together some really great things can happen and so the leadership call is really about enabling a lot of the top down support 
for the bottom-up activity that often has just sort of percolated. And I want to use this as a big frame for talking about open education leadership. This is, I just put this together yesterday, but this sort of represents how I've been thinking about the leadership space. And I know this is like pretty detailed and involved, but let me just take a few moments to talk about this and to describe what I'm trying to say with this particular picture. Um, I've kind of created four quadrants here. Um, in the top left are what are the enablers of open education? Top right is who are the practitioners of open education? Bottom left is what's the tech infrastructure that un underlies open education? And bottom right is what's the ecosystem of open education? And within each of those quadrants, I've kind of created a set of, of points that talk about the key topics that I think open education leadership will be uh, needing to address. So to, to, for example, in the enablers part, uh, there's things like policy, funding, business models, reward structures, sustainability, these kinds of topics or subjects are the kinds of things that can enable open education. And those are the kinds of topics and subjects that I think open education leaders need to be addressing from the top down. If you're a decision maker or a funder um, and you have the ability to enable open education, then these are the, the kinds of things that you will likely be engaged in looking at and trying to assess. On the funding side, I just wanna highlight a couple of things. There's been significant investments made in open education. Um, and significant savings, and that's often a real driver. Um, we need to talk a lot more about what the return on that investment is and the value proposition of open education. And, and also I think that um, in addition to seeking investments, I think part of what is involved here in this, in this little section around enabling open education is thinking about how to use the public money that is invested in education and education systems differently. So it's not always more money that's needed. Uh, often I think from a leadership point of view, it's an assessment of how to use the existing funds we have in a different way. Moving over to the top right, and I said, I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about this particular slide because this really does, in my view, kind of conceptualize how I think about leadership. Um, so on the top right, we have practitioners. And so this, from a leadership point of view, is how do we enable the teachers, the students, the librarians, and even ideally, eventually, the public, from my point of view, to get involved and participate and make use of open education. Um, clearly, there's some aspects to the teaching and learning process in terms of practices associated with preparing to teach and then delivering teaching. Um, and this is where I think some exciting work around open pedagogy is happening. And then uh, from a practices point of view, how do we find and use and modify and create open education? And how do we leverage this possibility for participatory co-creation? And, and importantly, in my point of view, is this is like a whole social system for collaborating. How do we enable practitioners to collaborate with another with one another and to leverage the expertise that they each have. So from a leadership point of view, I'd be thinking about how do I make that stuff happen and help practitioners make use of open education. I put DEI up in the top right, that's diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is I think another er area of open education that we're trying to enable. How do we ensure that as many people have access to education as possible and how do we uh, practice diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of open education. So we've got enablers and we've got practitioners. And then across the bottom, in the bottom left, we've got a whole sort of tech infrastructure piece around what are the technologies that underlie and enable open education from a tech perspective. And I've divided it up into three little pieces. Um, I think that there's a need for leadership around technical infrastructure associated with the content part. So that's authoring and publishing tools. That's having collections of high quality content, perhaps in repositories. And that's also embedding open education within learning systems. And so those are a whole suite of tech infrastructure. Um, there's also, of course, a legal piece, which might be uh, that we might think of Creative Commons as enabling a way of applying a license to resources to express their openness. 
But the part that's really missing from my point of view currently is the people infrastructure, which I've captured at the bottom left, which, which includes things like communities of practice, systems for curation, and social networks of people who uh, maybe share a common subject area or a discipline who want to localize, iterate, translate content and create high quality content as part of a social network, not as a sole solo effort, but as a collaborative effort. So what are the, from, from my point of view, if a leadership perspective, what are the tech infrastructure pieces that we can put in place to enable the people social network aspect of open education? And then lastly, in the bottom right, from a leadership point of view, I think that we need to have a lot more focus on what I'm calling the ecosystem. This is perhaps the most neglected part of the open education space at this point in time. If you, if you think like I do that on that spectrum of open education innovation, that you were over on the far right hand side, that it is a system change, then, then we be, need to begin to imagine what is the possible new way that this system could work. So we have the current education system, what's the possible new alternative? And how does open education make that possible? Um, a lot of people I talk to um, speak about open education in this way, that it's a culture and system change, but rarely do they actually articulate what it is that they think it could become. And so when we're speaking about primary and secondary as a system or post-secondary as a system, I think we need to begin to explore what the alternative view or ways in which those systems might operate and how open education enables those things to, to be part of. Um, this new uh, framework for education. And then below those, those first three bullets are a whole bunch of other components that I think are part of this ecosystem view. Um, the corporate providers. Uh, we currently have an increasing number of suppliers from the outside who are looking to provide resources and services into the open education space. How do they fit in that ecosystem? There's a lot of tension, I think, between the open education practitioners, the community, and the providers, and a, a reluctance to see the same old uh, business practices being used within the open education space. There's organizations like UNESCO and their open education recommendation that's coming up this, uh, later this year, as well as the sustainable development goals. How do they fit with the rest of us that are are to looking to put in place open education and, um, and how, what's the relationship between these various providers? When we're speaking about open education, are we thinking about it regionally or globally? Uh, another part of the ecosystem is what's the relationship to the other aspects of open that are happening in education? Things like open access on the research side or MOOCs or even galleries, libraries, archives and museums increasingly making their collections open and open data, open science I could include there too. And then if we want to think even bigger, um, open education is largely about sharing. And there's lots of other very similar efforts to enable sharing in other sectors. So we have um, things like smart cities or even the sharing economy. And what is the relationship of open education to these larger efforts around sharing uh, within cities and within the economy? And, and when we're speaking about an ecosystem view, then I also think it's worth considering how we expand this notion of an open education ecosystem to include non-traditional players, not schools and universities and colleges, but entities like Wikimedia, Spark, the World Bank, uh, ICDE, a sister organization to ours. These are all players within the ecosystem and we have yet, as an open education movement, to see our leadership tackle what's the change that we are trying to enable. Here's the current system, what's the possible new system, and how do all these players fit within that ecosystem? So uh, when I'm speaking about leadership or thinking about leadership within open education, I think about these four quadrants, if you will, enablers, practitioners, tech infrastructure, and the overall ecosystem as being components that we as uh, leaders need to be trying to enable and support. And I'm going to stop sharing there and just see if there's any uh, comments or questions about that um, as a framework for, for how we'll talk about the rest of this session on open education leadership this morning. Anybody want to say anything, question that, probe at it, 
say, Paul, you're crazy. <laughs> okay. Jenrin likes it. Not crazy. Okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I'm glad you're saying that. <laughs> okay. Keep on. All right. Okay. I'm going to go back to sharing then. Um, so it seems like uh, this sort of is making sense to most of you. It's a pretty big framework, I know. And this is like a very ambitious view of what open education and leadership entails. Um, but that's just the way I think. All right, so here's a few, I wanna now switch from that framework to talking about some of the initiatives that the Open Education Consortium has been engaged in or is engaged in to try to help all of that, help across all four of those quadrants. I was asked, um, Specifically, I was told to uh, make sure that I talk about this event we did last December called the Open Education Leadership Summit. Um, this is an event that we jointly did um, with the International Council for Open and Online Distance Education and uh, the French Ministries for Education, both at the primary and secondary level as well as at um, the university level. And essentially what we tried to do was invite uh, open education leaders from around the world to come together for a two-day convening in Paris at LUCNAM, the, the facility you see uh, in the picture. And we try to um, invite leaders of institutions, leaders of organizations, people in government who perhaps have funding and policy decision-making control over open education, and then leaders from the open education movement. And, and we ended up bringing together about 176 people from over 45 countries and engage them in a, not just a sit and listen to kind of keynote plenary sessions, but engage them in a kind of hands-on exploration of how do we think about and plan our open education initiatives to enable top-down support for bottom-up activity, and how can we think about linking our various open education initiatives that are taking place in different subject area domains and different countries together in coordinated ways. That was kind of what we were trying to enable. Um, I won't talk about everything that took place there, but I was encouraged to talk about this, which was uh, uh, essentially a roadmap toolkit that we distributed. Actually, let me just stop sharing. I have one right here. I'll show you. It looks like this. So it's an actual roadmap um, that kind of folds out like a roadmap. And on the back side is a description of all the different forms of open education. So open education resources, open access, MOOCs, open science. And we realized that the leaders invited could be engaged in any of those. And then on the other side was a, a space to map out your open education initiative. And so this was an actual handout that we gave to everyone um, along with some, um, some additional tools to help them map out their roadmap. So to go back to this, on the, on the left-hand side of this roadmap, we invited people to uh, essentially list the open education initiatives they had underway. So that could be, we're doing open textbooks, or we're doing MOOCs, or we're doing um, open data, open science. And so on the left-hand side, they would uh, document those. And on the right-hand side, they would uh, plan those, what the, what's their plan for those initiatives going out for two years. And we color, we asked them to color code some things. And so you can see the legend um, asked for people to color code in orange your open education initiatives, but then in green to indicate whether it's open education resources or MOOCs or open science or open access. But then further to that, what are, who are the people and community involved in the development and use of those open education initiatives or those open education uh, resources? And what's your operation and sustainability model? And what's the, what's the value proposition and set of benefits that you're trying to achieve? So we actually had people document and color code all of that as part of this roadmap exercise. And, um, and that was a way of trying to surface, if we go back to my, my leadership quadrant document, uh, that was a way of trying to surface from a people and community point of view, who are the practitioners that are engaged, from uh, a benefits and value proposition, a little bit around uh, what's the return on investment of making an investment in open education and so on. So you can see it starts to tack, it, tack 
it starts to go into each of these areas, each of these facets of open education leadership. Uh, here's an example of a roadmap that was created <clears throat> and over 90% of the roadmaps um, not only documented their initiative, but across the bottom, we asked them to document or to identify what they have, because in open education, you're producing things that others can make use of. What do you have that you're making available for others? What is it you're producing that you're sharing with others? And further to that, what might you need from others? So as you're developing your open education initiative, are there some things that you need that you just don't have in-house yourself? And so 90% of the roadmaps actually uh, named things that they have for others and needs that they would like to get from others. And, um, and there was this real hunger for collaboration, um, including not just within a region, but across regions. Uh, we actually had a, a wall of collaboration that looked like this, where we invited people to put up uh, little notes uh, expressing areas of interest in collaboration and you can see some rough numbers so there were 60 collaborations proposed around open education resources 27 for MOOCs and so on and then on day two we actually put people together to create some collaborative roadmaps and there were 13 different ones created which you can see listed here at the bottom uh, for me this event was was um, was really interesting because of the way it did bring both enablers and practitioners together to work in a collaborative way for two days um, and try to explore how their respective work is being planned out into the future and what it is that they're doing that might benefit from each other. Um, the, there was a real kind of energy and buzz in the room. Some of you here in this webinar were there, so thanks for participating in it. I think you'd agree that that's a, 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 a really good example of how we might think about convening leaders together to work across regions and across these kind of areas of leadership that need to happen within open education. So, uh, so that's one way that we're trying to move forward with doing leadership um, in the open education space. Um, here's a few more um, that the Open Education Consortium has been doing. Uh, we give out annually Open Education Awards for Excellence. And actually, I'm just going to stop sharing and drop this link into the chat for you um, and encourage you to go and have a look. Um, let's see. Okay. Put this here. So if you haven't looked at this year's award winners, we just announced, and I just put in the link into chat. Please feel free to go and have a look. Um, I'm going to go and have a look with you. I'm going to go back. Where's my... Sorry. Sorry, just a sec. <laughs> While you're looking, <laughs> I'm going to go back and see if I can look too. Um... So uh, we, we produce a whole set of awards around um, up here and here, around um, both both individual awards um, so this year the individual awards uh, we gave out a leadership award so one of the things we're trying to do is if you think about that quadrant that has to do with practitioners who are the people in the open education space who are exemplifying great leadership and and this year, we were really delighted to um, make that leadership award to Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams, who's from the University of Cape Town in South Africa, who's done some really great work around um, the aspects of social justice within open education. And so um, I really encourage you to kind of click on these read more options here and find out more about the work of both Cheryl as well as Carlos, who was uh, the recipient of the Practitioner Award this year. Um, and, and also, uh, we're delighted to also be giving out student awards because um, when we think about leadership, it's not always just uh, senior administrators or faculty and teachers who are doing exemplary work. Sometimes it's students and, um, and increasingly so uh, as we start to see students actually getting involved in creating open education 
Um, so we also gave out some student awards and, and the, their stories are really fun and interesting. Um, and I encourage you to have a look at them as, as being examples of people who are leaders in the open education space. And in addition to these individual awards, we also give out awards that have to do with resources, tools, and practices. And here I'm showing you who the uh, recipients of those awards were this year. Awards for open MOOCs, for open courses, for doing offline open education, for textbooks, for collections, for repositories, translations, curation, pedagogy, lots and lots of really fantastic work going on in the open education space, including research, innovation, and policy. So, so uh, there's some good stuff to explore here and great examples of people doing exemplary work in, in open education that I encourage you to have a look at. And I think this, this aspect of, um, of su supporting leadership in open education is really important from my point of view because um, there's so many people doing fantastic work in the open education space who never get recognized, never get thanked. And I, I think a little bit of thankfulness um, goes a long way to uh, making them feel good about the work that they're doing and also encouraging them and motivating them to do more. So if we think about, if I think about the, the open education awards, I would say like the primary focus is on the people part here in the top right around practitioners but there's also a little bit of stuff around the awards that relates to policy, especially um, that I think is being enabled and even some awards that relate to some of the infrastructure components, whether it's the content or the repositories or some of the, the simulations and so on that are, um, that are uh, being developed within the open education space. So the awards I feel uh, address some of these quadrants um, associated with open education leadership in a really nice way. Um, here's a few more things that we're currently pursuing right now um, coming up. Oh my gosh, this is like next week. <laughs> uh, we're we're co-hosting and facilitating the Open Education Policy Forum with Centrum Sofrova and Spark. Um, this is an event that is taking place in um, Warsaw, and it is focused on bringing together. Um, people who are in a position to actually develop policy and put in place policy in support of open education. Um, and, these, and, and so we have about 20 fellows coming from around the world who will engage in a two day uh, kind of intensive workshop to help develop uh, a plan for what their policy will address and the activities and tasks associated with actually enabling it. And then they'll, uh, and they'll be supported by, we have about another 15 or so people who will be um, non-fellows, but helpers to the fellows, uh, mentors and assistants in helping them prepare their plan for open education policy. And then there'll be a, 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 an additional support provided for a six month incubation process leading up to Open Education Week next spring, uh, where, where we'll be at, at the end of that six month period, we'll be asking all of the fellows to, to share with everyone um, the policy that they created and the work that they, um, that they have prepared in terms of uh, supporting open education initiatives in their part of the world. And so um, let me just, I, I have the link there on the slide, but let me just drop it in here too in case you're interested in exploring that. It's too late to actually, if, you, if you're, if you is anyone actually coming? Somebody might be. Oh, Jenrin is, yeah, right. Or Cable Green, Aka, <laughs> Jenrin is coming. Good. Um, and yeah, I just dropped the link in there. So if you're interested in policy, uh, that might be, this has uh, been an annual event, although this, this year, the format for this event is a little different in terms of it being uh, focused on helping people prepare policy. Um, but, but this is a good example of uh, us trying to support open education leadership as it pertains to that sort of top left quadrant and, and enabling policy. And I've been talking for like 30 minutes now, so I'm just gonna stop and see 
what people's thoughts or questions might be, if you have any, um, I'm happy to turn the mic over to you or to invite you to express uh, some thoughts or ideas in chat. And I'm just gonna take a drink of water. <laughs> it's early morning here in Vancouver, so I'm still waking up. Any comments? No. <laughs> All right. I actually Go have ahead. a comment. This is Byron, not Cable Green. Um, <laughs> so I really appreciate the um, the kind of overview of what happened at um, in the 2018 conference, and I was wondering if there might be a way to share some of the um, the notes or the follow up actions that that occurred. In particular, I was curious about the collaborations that um, that your conference um, inspired, and I would I would like to see if if there's a way that um, we can in maybe future conferences or in future meetings um, help nudge certain collaborations that have started in the past or that are kind of emerging in meetings, kind of nudge them along. So um, seeing what's happened already would be yeah. really helpful. Yeah, sure, Jenwin. Yeah, so um, here's a link to, um, on our website, I produced um, a bit of a summary uh, of what happened at that Open Education Leadership Summit. Um, there was a fairly lengthy summary document written up that actually uh, communicates um, uh, what took place and some of the key uh, learnings from it, as well as the collaborations that you're asking about. And, um, and some of those collaborations did continue. For example, I know Lena's here uh, from eCampus Ontario, and they were very interested in the nursing um, collaboration. And I think that, that that initiative, which sort of started at this Open Education Leadership Summit, did keep going even after the summit. Because as you probably know, generally, like the hard part is you get some energy and enthusiasm for doing something at an event where you're face to face, and then everyone goes home and keeping that going sustaining that energy and enthusiasm is really where the challenge is and and I know even with that initiative let's say the nursing one um, yes there was energy and, and enthusiasm and less yes they had some subsequent meetings virtually after the open education leadership summit um, even with that some people dropped out and it evolved and changed a little bit from what it was originally conceived of as being um, which is natural and I think there's nothing wrong with that um, and I think that um, as I consider how to sustain these face-to-face -face things we do that generate a lot of buzz um, I think that there is a need to have some leadership components associated with sustaining those which is which is often really hard especially when you're connecting different groups together who are not co-located in the same area and you're trying to make um, partnerships and collaboration happen across multiple organizations. And Lena, I don't know if you want to say anything more, but that's kind of my take. Yeah, that's a good take, Paul. Um, I think that um, the biggest hurdle that we uh, came up against are just was was timing and different um, needs within our jurisdictions because we were each of the partners were. Uh, government funded agencies that had certain requirements within the year um, to be able to deliver. And so our, our years and our project timing just didn't line up. So I think that the, the moral of that story is that you need at least a year lead time planning in order to actually take a coordinated approach across jurisdictions. If it's within the same jurisdiction, you probably have a better chance um, of, of making it work. But yeah, that was the, that was the biggest hurdle was it wasn't a lack of interest. It wasn't a lack of will or agreement on, on the approach. It was just, what's your mandate at this time? And does it happen to align with, um, with this activity? So if you had a year to plan, uh, at least, then that would probably make it possible. Um, I'll just add to Paul that I, I really like um, in your table, I agree that open ecosystem is probably the quadrant that has the least 
attention um, because it's 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 the most complicated. Complicated. Yes. Um, and so I wonder whether um, it might be within OEC's capacity to add a open ecosystem award, some sort of some sort of recognition of a, of work that bridges gaps between higher ed open education work and the rest of the world um you know um, um, something that actually starts to reach beyond um in our nursing project that we did do we managed to um engage public health um agencies uh toronto public health and ontario public health in the work and what it it made the pro the final product um, so much stronger and so much more thoughtful because it started to take, it started to look at the education that was happening within the university and think about it um, on a broader spectrum. So I would love to, I would love OEC to, in, to set a standard of excellence for that and to encourage others to start thinking outside their own boxes. I like that, Lena. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. I, th I think you're right to say that that's also the hard quadrant. It's there's a lot of um, players and a lot of jockeying for position. And, uh, and it feels like it's still evolving. Not that they're ever going to be, you know, finalized. But, um, but that's an interesting suggestion. I hadn't really thought about creating an award for that. Um, yeah, thank you. Anyone else want to comment on anything before I move on? It's nice to see some faces I recognize <laughs> and some new people. Can uh, I just make one more comment? I don't want to yeah. hog the, the microphone. Um, well, I, I loved what Lena was saying about um, the ways we could strengthen um, the ecosystem. And one thing that you had mentioned in your notes about the, um, the 2018 conference um, was particularly striking. You were, you were saying that people right off the bat, just from getting together, were able to map out like what they, they could offer others, or maybe, um, maybe I was reading into this, but I assume like what they would need as well. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I wanted to share a landscape analysis that was done by a series of open organizations in a different but analogous context where um, CEOs from different organizations mapped out their like strengths and weaknesses and how they could envision collaborating in their own ecosystem yeah. um, together. And I, I think something like that could be really powerful and um, seeing, seeing how you in just a couple of days were able to generate um, mm -hmm. some of that with the, the conference goers would be really cool. So this is um, called the sum of our parts open organization. So I'll just okay. see if I can add it. Anyway, that's it. Yeah, drop it into chat, Jenwin, thanks. Yeah, I mean, th that was an interesting part of the Open Education Leadership Summit. The idea that the work that we're developing in open education is, is creating uh, things that we have for others that are shareable is, the, you know, kind of part of the whole underlying principle of open education is that it's about, um, not just creating a resource for your own use, but something that might be useful for someone else. But as we all know, if you've been in open education for a period of time, you realize that that's actually an under um, utilized aspect of open education. Lots of stuff for sharing, not always a lot of stuff uh, that others are making use of. And so um, making it a formal part of the process that we had for that summit was really quite fascinating. What do you have that you're willing to share with others or producing that's shareable? And what do you need? And kind of thinking about how you're both helping others, but how others can help you. That kind of aspect seems fundamental to what we're trying to make possible in terms of um, open education. And thanks for the link. Um, yes, who owns education? <laughs> yeah, I think, well, so that goes back, in my view, Lena, to part of why. Um, I think it's a, a significant system change. If we're, if we're disrupting the ownership aspects, um, then we're also getting into really substantive system change. Um, I'm gonna take a few more minutes to highlight a few other aspects of the open education leadership work we're doing. Um, the Open Education Consortia is primarily looking at supporting open education globally around the world. 
but we also are acknowledging as open education matures and flourishes that there are regional differences. And so um, as part of the open education consortia, we have some regional nodes, I'm calling them. Um, a longstanding one uh, is the Community Consor College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, which has lots of members all across the US uh, from 34 different states and it runs a really great community of practice. Um, and we're also, um, and Marcella's here as part of today's webinar, uh, the Open Education Consortia has worked with open education leaders across Latin America to create a Latin America regional node um, that currently has about 10 different countries participating and is, and is looking at areas like uh, those that we've talked about for from a leadership point of view, policy and strategy, teacher training, and the state of open in each country. Um, I thought for today's webinar, I'd highlight something that the, uh, the Community College Consortia for Open Educational Resources is doing as a pre-conference event. So if anyone's going to the Open Education Conference taking place in Phoenix at the end of October, um, there's a, a regional leaders in open education event being planned by CCC OER and uh, the bullets on the right uh, of this particular slide highlight some of the topics that the leaders from across different US states have identified as uh, things that they'd like to engage in discussing at this event pertaining to leadership. So can there be some sort of leadership model or entity that facilitates leadership across open education initiatives taking place in different states? How can we work together to align some of our work with some of the other initiatives taking place? There's a lot of really great uh, topics here. And so uh, actually, I think in the bottom left, I put the four sort of breakout group areas that are being planned for this leadership gathering in Phoenix policy, uh, the sharing and strategizing part of that. How do we steward open content and data? Uh, the pro whole professionalism and professional development of open educators. And then as uh, open education now has been around for an extended period of time, how are we thinking about sustainability? And, and I think that those, those four topics are great. I think they also map really nicely to the four quadrants that I've been proposing frame open open education leadership. And uh, I look forward to participating in this event. I think it's gonna be really fa fascinating to see what happens. Um, and then I mentioned the LATAM regional node. Um, and this is just a very simple snapshot of some of what they're focused on. I, I wanna highlight a couple of things. One is that this regional node will be in Spanish. And so we totally acknowledge how open education is taking place in different parts of the world in the native language of different parts of the world. And when it comes to something like a regional node, it's important to, to kind of support the language of that region. Um, down the left-hand side, you see some of the things I, I mentioned earlier associated with it, no, this node, uh, the interest of supporting teacher training across these Latin America regions, creating state of the open reports, uh, how, figuring out how to uh, develop and, and put in place open policy infrastructure, having a library and so on. So there's quite a lot of uh, really great work that's being planned and developed in this regional node. And so um, I think the regional nodes are good examples of trying to enable uh, or trying to get some leadership happening around enablers, around practitioners and around tech infrastructure. The ecosystem piece I feel is like a little uh, more complicated than, um, but it, but it's, I feel like this bottom right quadrant is, um, is work to be done. <laughs> Maybe I'll say it that way. And, uh, and I, I'm interested in working with others who have an interest in trying to map out what that ecosystem looks like. Um, a couple of others, um, this will be really quick and then I'll just stop entirely and we can just chat for a few more minutes at the end here. Uh, we have partnered with Moodle to do something called the Open EdTech Global Festival, which is taking place in Barcelona uh, towards the end of November. Um, and there's the URL. Um, I encourage you to go have a look. It's really focused on trying to bring together those that 
are providers of open education technologies and services, as well as those who purchase or, or acquire those for use within their educational uh, system. And what, what this event's trying to do is look at, if we were to think of the, um, this, it's sort of focused on this tech infrastructure piece in the bottom left hand side, although there's some pieces in the top left around um, funding and business models and so on that it's also focused on. Um, but the Open EdTech Global Festival is intended to bring together open EdTech providers and have them do hackathons and sprints to try to better integrate their technology systems so that there's a more seamless end-to-end -end solution that someone can acquire to do open education, as well as to conceptualize how they might partner and work together to improve the value proposition and the business models associated with open education and, and present those as uh, being advantageous to those models that uh, primarily are focused on proprietary and closed systems. So um, this event is really for a different kind of leader. Um, it's for the, pr the people who are involved in the tech infrastructure side of the open education space. Um, it should be interesting. And then we have our own open education global conference that's taking place in Milan um, at the end of November. And this is our annual convening that we organize and moves around a different uh, countries and places every year. Um, <clears throat> this year it's in Milan and um, it's, it's uh, the biggest open education conference focused on open education globally. There are other open education conferences that, uh, that focus primarily on a particular part of the world, but this one um, definitely is ambitious in terms of addressing the entire landscape of open education around the world. And, um, and there's the URL for it. I'm gonna stop sharing and, and uh, just jump back out and give you that URL and encourage you to look at it a little bit with me. Um, just to highlight some of what I think are the, the great leadership parts. And, um, oh, and I see Lena, thank you, Lena, for the thing you dropped into chat about the open ecosystem. That's great. Oh, some good stuff here. Um, okay, so um, there's the link to the, to the um, open education uh, conference we're doing in Milan, uh, starting with the keynotes. And, um, and I'll just go back to, to sharing. Um, so um, I need to get there myself. Conference. So we have uh, four really great keynotes this year. Um, some of you may be familiar with FET, which is the Interactive Simulations Initiative coming out of the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, and these simulations are really fantastic open education resources. They actually won an award as part of our awards this year, uh, focused on science and math. And so Kathy Perkins, who leads that, uh, will be one of our keynotes. Uh, Paola Corti, who's um, uh, at the Politecnico de Milano, our host institution in Milan, is really interested in the uh, role of students. And so we'll actually be doing it, she'll be doing a keynote um, that looks at the practitioners, including students, and how uh, they, they are increasingly becoming engaged in, in open education in ways that contribute to the education um, that they're receiving and in a way begin to take ownership of that and define their own future as learners and participants in the education system. Dominic Orr is another keynote we're, we're uh, pleased to have and he'll be doing a session around the new learning pathways that are emerging in the open and digital world. Um, this is really interesting as we see increasingly how there's a growing focus on the new job skills that will might be needed in in uh, in the future and how we need to think about enabling pathways and learning for them and even what the new education landscape might look like in 2030 so this is his session and that aspect of uh, trying to talk about the education landscape in 2030 i think is 
is a really interesting effort to try to focus on that ecosystem quadrant in my bottom right. And so I really am looking forward to hearing Dominic's uh, views on that. And then um, the Leadership Award winner from this year, Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams, is also doing a keynote uh, talking about the warp and weft of open education and social justice. And this will be also a really incredible keynote. So the keynotes are, are really uh, going to be um, good examples of open education leaders from around the world talking about key aspects of education and open education and the, the leadership parts of those. So, and then the, the schedule, uh, we now have the schedule up. And so those of you that haven't looked at it yet, I encourage you um, to check it out. I actually like how you can choose from the session format to just look at sessions that have to, to have a particular format. And this year we've focused on making the conference more interactive and participatory, less sitting and listening and more kind of direct engagement. The action labs I think are really interesting this year. And so I've just kind of searched through, I just did a quick uh, sort to kind of highlight some of the action labs, which will, which will be very participatory. And you can see some of the topics here, policy making, uh, reflections on teaching practice around reuse, um, the aspects of sharing. So these all kind of pertain to different things that I've been highlighting through my four quadrants, open pedagogy starter kits, uh, how to build a student network for OER advocacy. So the engaging students even more, um, an action lab on open education policy making and so on. So there's some very good sessions here, uh, not just for those that are uh, involved at the front line of doing open education, but those who are supporting its planning and its uh, leadership. Uh, so as you can see, some of these events are, are deliberately and intentionally trying to uh, be supports for the bottom up and the top down parts of open education leadership. And so I'm going to stop there. Um, those of you who don't know us, we're a global nonprofit member based network. Um, so we are a members-based network and we invite new members um, at, at any time. We have lots of members from all over the world and, and we're really excited about the work we're doing and, and uh, have just an awesome team right now and we're really, uh, really doing well. So it's been uh, exciting and fun. Um, so we have like six minutes and I, I thought I'd stop there. That's kind of a quick snapshot of some of what I think about in terms of open education leadership and some of the activities that we're very directly involved in supporting. Um, I invite questions, comments, and other things perhaps that uh, you are doing in your own work that you'd like to share related to open education leadership. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Lots going on and the global view of all this is always really fascinating. Um, Lena, can you? Yeah, so go ahead. Yes. So, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob, and um, I'm relatively new to this. So I will uh, admit I find this a bit overwhelming. Yes, slash I'm exciting. sorry. <laughs> okay. um, no, no, but that's why I'm here. Yeah. Um, so uh, every, every day is a little step forward. Um, and I just, uh, so thank you. Uh, I've learned a lot today, mm -hmm. took a lot of good notes. I will be in Phoenix um, okay. in uh, October. So I look forward to meeting many of you there. Yep. Um, and I'm, I'm still, as I said, new. So things I'm interested in are, and I'm a faculty member, by the way. So uh, that's, I'm sort of very interested in the hands on, on the ground, working with students, yeah. how I can improve their ability to use and create content um, and, and understanding a lot of the uh, copyright laws. So as I mentioned, I have a colleague who's a librarian who's been helping me with that. Um, but I just wanted to share that with everybody here and uh, thanks for listening. Yeah, well, that's great. Great to have you here. And I, I acknowledge that uh, doing a sort of deep dive on <laughs> open education leadership like I did today is like a bit scary sometimes. But and, and I also appreciate you you highlighting for, for us the areas of interest and need that you have, because I think that actually I think you'll find there's a lot of great stuff that, at the conference in Phoenix about that. And, and also the CCC OER community is doing a lot of fantastic things around helping uh, people like yourself skill up around doing this effectively. 
Great. Uh, a few people post stuff. So Alexis, you want to share a little bit of description of what you've posted? Sure. So um, one of the favorite parts of my job right now is, is the professional development we do across our 64 institution system. Um, and so the community course series is one is kind of the online analog to the face to face professional development that we do a lot. And so there are these six little mini courses that are, you know, you can take them sequentially, but the idea is that you jump into the one that's most speaks to the part of OER that you're most interested in at the moment and gives you resources and kind of the historical theoretical background for the pieces that we're, you're working on. Um, this particular group uh, may be interested in the sharing and promoting which just the refresh on it just went live this week so um, we're still working on cleaning up and kind of the series has been out for a little over a year now um, we've gotten a lot of great feedback from users so four of the six courses have gone through a refresh in the past couple of months and we'll, we'll um, post the other two by the end of the year. Um, Lena, we do offer synchronous options for schools within our system upon request. Um, there is a badge possible for people that complete within our system, but all of the badge criteria are also open and the badge images are open. So if you wanna host your own badge in whatever system you use, and I know eCampus Ontario is pretty on badge game. So, <laughs> um, so I'm sure that there could be definitely analogs there. So there is a, the public facing side of this is a WordPress site. We also have it available in um, Pressbooks and as Google Docs. So um, if you want any of those source files for any of it, you know, it's all CC BY, so tear it apart and use it locally as you see fit. Nice. Thanks, Alexis. That's great. Yeah, and, absolutely. And Lena, can you share something about the, the link that you posted um, around toward an open ecosystem? Oh, sure. Um, so it was, uh, it started off as a conversation specifically about um, educational technology that bridges um, higher ed and the workforce. So that's where it came from. But what it what it kind of um, what it became was a document which kind of more widely articulates principles that eCampus Ontario holds um, for vendors um, that we work with um, or that you know work in our orbit. Um, and you'll see that there are principles in there like public good, there are principles around research, there are principles around data, um, there are principles around interoperability, which is why I thought of it, Paul, because when you were talking about um, the tech, the, the event in Barcelona, it seems like that's exactly um, connected with, with the thinking. So it was actually, it was inspired by the CARE framework and, and by your work, Paul, um, from um, Made with uh, Creative Commons, mm -hmm. um, just to kind of start thinking a little bit more intentionally about our standards um, for for what we look for um, and what we expect when we're doing multi-vendor projects. Thank you. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that can be contentious. <laughs> I know working with the vendor community is hard. Um, well, look, it's the top of the hour. Uh, thank you so much, everyone who's, uh, who's joined us today. I really appreciate your, your being here and also the sharing that's been taking place in chat. Um, We'll be doing more webinars going forward. We invite requests for webinars. If there's a particular topic you'd love us to do, I'm more than happy to, to address it. And um, great to meet some old and new faces here. So uh, uh, thanks for coming and I'll stop there. Thank you all, bye for now. And those of you that'll be in Phoenix, I'll see you there. Stop.